Appendicitis. The objective of this video is to give you a brief introduction, pathogenesis, clinical presentation, lab findings, imaging, and management of acute appendicitis. Appendicitis is an inflammation of the vestigial vermiform appendix, which is one of the most common causes of acute abdominal pain and one of the most frequent indications for an emergent abdominal surgical procedure worldwide. Appendicitis is common and is seen in up to 1 in 10 individuals over a lifetime. It occurs in 10% of the population. Most cases present between the ages of 10 and 30 years. It is most common abdominal surgical emergency. There's a slight male predominance among the patients presenting before age 30 with a male to female ratio approximately 3 is to 2. Pathogenesis of appendicitis. The natural history of appendicitis is similar to that of other inflammatory processes involving hollow visceral organs. Initial inflammation of the appendicial wall is followed by localized ischemia, perforation, and the development of a contained abscess or generalized peritonitis. Appendiceal obstruction has been proposed as the primary cause of appendicitis. Appendiceal obstruction causes lumen distension, increasing wall stress, as given by the Laplace's law. This increased wall stress causes vessels to thrombose, and appendix becomes ischemic, favoring bacterial overgrowth. Common organisms involved in gangrenous and perforated appendicitis include E. coli, Peptostreptococcus, Bacterioides fragilis, and Pseudomonas species. The pathogenesis in children is usually associated with lymphoid hyperplasia in about 60% of cases, often secondary to a viral infection like adenovirus, measles virus, or immunization. The pathogenesis in adults is different in that the most common cause is a fecal lith, which is a hard stool, which obstructs the proximal lumen of the appendix in about 30 to 35 percent of the cases, which is similar to the pathogenesis of acute diverticulitis. Increased intraluminal pressure from the obstruction causes mucosal ischemia and infarction. Protracted obstruction may result in perforation, which is a point worth to be noted. Obstruction can be due to lymphoid hyperplasia, as seen in more younger patients, or fecal lits, or in some cases, neoplasia, as seen in the older patients. When obstruction of the appendix is a cause of appendicitis, the obstruction leads to an increase in luminal and intramural pressure, resulting in thrombosis and occlusion of the small vessels in the appendiceal wall and cause a stasis of lymphatic flow. As the appendix becomes engorged, the visceral afferent nerve fibers entering the spinal cord at T8 to T10 are stimulated, leading to vague central or periumbilical abdominal pain. Well localized pain occurs later in the course when inflammation involves the adjacent parietal peritoneum. With enough necrosis, perforation follows, which results in diffuse peritonitis. Now let's go ahead and discuss about the various clinical presentations of patients with acute appendicitis. The presentation is characterized by abdominal pain that typically originates in the periumbilical region and shifts towards the right lower quadrant. Patients give a history of abdominal pain, which is the most common symptom, and is reported in nearly all confirmed cases of appendicitis. The clinical presentation of acute appendicitis is described as a constellation of the following classic symptoms. Right lower quadrant abdominal pain, which is located in the right anterior iliac fossa, anorexia, nausea and vomiting. During the first 24 hours after the symptoms develop, approximately 90% of patients develop inflammation 
and perhaps necrosis of the appendix, but not perforation. Inflammation of the peritoneum leads to severe tenderness on palpation or movement of the abdomen. This may manifest with rebound tenderness or guarding on exam. Several pathognomonic signs exist for acute appendicitis. Some of them are McBurney's point tenderness. McBurney's point is where the most pain usually exists for these patients. It is located two-thirds of the distance from the umbilicus to the right anterior superior iliac spine. Rovsing's sign is referred pain to the right lower quadrant upon palpation of the left lower quadrant. This sign is also called indirect tenderness and is indicative of right-sided local peritoneal irritation. Psoas sign. A psoas sign is right lower quadrant pain with right hip flexion or extension. The psoas sign is associated with a retrocecal appendix. The inflamed appendix may lie against the right psoas muscle, causing the patient to shorten the muscle by drawing up the right knee. Passive extension of the iliopsoas muscle with hip extension causes right lower quadrant pain. Obturator sign. The obturator sign is associated with a pelvic appendix. This test is based on the principle that the inflamed appendix may lie against the right obturator internus muscle. When the clinician flexes the patient's right hip and knee, followed by internal rotation of the right hip, this elicits right lower quadrant pain. The classic sign of appendicitis is periumbilical diffuse abdominal tenderness that localizes to right lower quadrant at the McBurney's point. The differential diagnosis is broad and includes diverticulitis, ruptured ectopic pregnancy, nephrolithiasis, pelvic inflammatory disease, pyelonephritis, ovarian torsion, Meckel's diverticulum, and mesenteric adenitis. Periappendicial abscess with or without perforation is the most common complication of acute appendicitis. What are the various lab findings? A mild leukocytosis is present in most patients with acute appendicitis. Approximately 80% of patients have leukocytosis and left shift, which is an increase in total white blood cell count and bands. Bands or immature neutrophils. The sensitivity and specificity of an elevated white blood cell count in acute appendicitis are 80% and 55% respectively. Acute appendicitis is unlikely when the white blood cell count is normal, except in the very early course of the illness. In comparison, mean white blood cell counts are higher in patients with a gangrenous or perforated appendix. Now, some of the values of the white blood cell count with respect to the severity of appendix is given by acute appendicitis have white blood cell counts of about 14,500 plus minus 7,300 cells per microliter. A gangrenous appendicitis would result in a white blood cell count of about 17,100 plus minus 3,900 cells per microliter. When the appendix is perforated, the mean white blood cell count is about 17,900 plus minus 2,100 cells per microliter. Mild elevations in serum bilirubin have been noted to be a marker for appendicial perforation with a sensitivity of about 70% and a specificity of about 86%. Now let's take a look at the imaging modalities that come into handy in diagnosing a patient who has acute abdominal pain and likely to have acute appendicitis. Patients with acute appendicitis on standard abdominal CT scan with contrast show enlarged appendicial diameter greater than 6 mm with an occluded lumen, appendicial wall thickening of about 2 mm or more, periappendicial fat stranding, appendicial wall enhancement, appendicolith, which is seen in approximately 25% of the patients. The most accurate ultrasound finding for acute appendicitis is an appendicial diameter of about 6 mm or greater. The treatment patient is being diagnosed to have acute appendicitis. 
the first thing that needs to be done is to evaluate if the patient has a perforated appendix or a non-perforated appendix. The definitive treatment for acute appendicitis is appendectomy. Now let's take a look at this flowchart of evaluation of patient with acute appendicitis. Now when a patient is being diagnosed to have acute appendicitis, the first thing that needs to be done is to evaluate if the patient has a perforated appendix or a non-perforated appendix. Assuming the patient has had a non-perforated appendix, the next step is to evaluate if the patient is fit for surgery or if the patient is agreeing to surgery. Now, if the patient is unfit or is refusing surgery, then intravenous antibiotics and in-hospital observation should be done for a patient with non-perforated appendicitis. Now, if the patient clinically improves, discharge the patient home on oral antibiotics to complete a 10-day course. If the patient does not improve clinically or is unfit for surgery, or if the patient refuses surgery, then an immediate appendectomy is mandated. On the other hand, if the patient has had a perforated appendix, look for if the patient is unstable or if the patient is being septic or if there is free perforation or generalized peritonitis. Now, in the event of any of these upper symptoms in the patient, an immediate appendectomy followed by a three to five day course of intravenous antibiotics is required. Now, in patients with perforated appendicitis who are stable with localized symptoms, an evaluation must be done to assess if the patient has had an abscess or if it's just a phlegmon. Now, if it is determined that the patient has had an abscess, intravenous antibiotics and percutaneous drainage of the abscess is required. And if the patient clinically improves, discharge him home with oral antibiotics to complete a seven to 10 day course and follow up in six to eight weeks. If the patient does not improve or if the patient has had a phlegmon with intravenous antibiotics and it does not improve yet, then an immediate appendectomy followed by three to five days of intravenous antibiotics will be required. So this concludes the management of acute appendicitis.